Yeah, we're pretty happy about how things have gone lately. Um, over the past year, we've had a somewhat elevated budget because Peter Thiel gave us last April a somewhat uh, increased uh, amount of funding, and we've had uh, a little bit of extra funding from elsewhere. Um, so we've been able to make good use of that and get some more projects going. And one of the biggest things that we did was we moved our research centre. We had a research centre, an internal laboratory in Sunnyvale in the Silicon Valley area um, for a little while, which was okay as far as it went, but it could only house really three or four researchers. And we've moved into a place in Mountain View, just a few miles away, which is perhaps three times the size. It can definitely fit, in fact, I would say it could fit as many as 15 researchers. We've got five or six at the moment. Um, and we'll be ramping that up as quickly as we can. Um, in terms of funding, actually the news has been getting even better. So a couple of months ago, we were approached by someone that I'd never heard of before, a relatively newly wealthy guy from Arizona, who uh, has ended up giving us uh, $600,000 for the coming year, which we're going to spend on some new projects. Um, and that was particularly heartening because that's the biggest donation that we've had from anyone other than Peter Thiel so far in the whole history of the foundation. And it's really going to help, I think, to have more than one um, you know, of these really wealthy people coming in at a relatively high level of donation. Um, in terms of the science, things have been going very nicely as well. The um, lysosomal enhancement project, uh, we find bacteria that can break down unusual things, has been proceeding and we have been focusing on the um, uh, in incorporation of these genes and enzymes into mammalian cells. That's a pretty tough project because lots of little tricks and little things that one has to do and we've been making steady progress there. But probably the most spectacular progress has been um, with one of our extramural projects, one of the projects that we're funding in universities elsewhere, um, namely the one in New York at Albert Einstein College of Medicine. What we're doing there is we're looking at, uh, we're trying to find out whether the um, DNA of older animals, especially older mice, um, accumulates a type of damage called epimutations, which is not like mutations, changes to the DNA sequence, it changes to the, well, the molecular modifications of the DNA and the proteins that it surrounds um, that determine which genes are turned on and off in particular cells. Um, there's a random, there's an accumulation of random noise in that, same as random mutations, and the question is, is the rate of accumulation of that random epigenetic noise, as it's called, um, is it sufficient to actually contribute to aging? I think it probably isn't, but we need to prove it experimentally. And the lab that we're doing this work in is the best lab in the world for this, undoubtedly. They're the lab that have shown most unequivocally the corresponding data on mutations. Um, but most importantly, we hired this fabulous postdoc who is the most green-fingered experimentalist you could imagine. And she's managed to do the hard part of this experiment, which is the development of the technique for actually doing the measurements. There's a special type of sequencing that you do called bisulfite sequencing that is um, necessary for, um, for, 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 for um, identifying these epimutations, as we call them. And the thing is you have to be able to do it on the DNA from one single cell. The technique, as it has historically been, you'd need hundreds and hundreds of cells in order to actually get any kind of information. So the sensitivity of the technique had to be very greatly improved before the actual question could be asked. And that's what the first 18 months of the project has been spent on, and she's done it. So we're going to get a very, very high-profile paper out of this very soon. That manuscript is in preparation right now. But also, we're going to be able to answer this very important question, so I'm really happy about it. But no, where it really um, sticks out uh, that we've made progress in terms of credibility is in terms of the number of people who are willing to um, get on board and support us publicly who were previously not. So for example, we now have 17 really prestigious people on our scientific advisory board, all of whom have signed up to a very strongly worded unequivocal endorsement of the sense method. And these are people with you know, world leading expertise in all of the various relevant areas. So it's not the sort of thing I would have been able to do a few years ago. Sure. In the US, there's a reasonable amount of support. In the UK, actually, there's 
rather a lot of scepticism still. Most of the people who are still holding out and trying to ridicule Sansa are in the UK. Um, uh, in Europe, it's all right. There's a reasonable amount of knowledge and positivity. But in the rest of the world, in Asia especially, um, we really haven't got going. There just isn't enough exposure of the whole thing. I haven't become particularly um, high-profile high in the media out there. I only get maybe one conference invitation a year in Asia, you know, out of the like 50 that I do each year worldwide. So um, we, we need to fix that. Thank you very much. Thank you.